Hi, I'm Graham from Blackmagic Design. In this update, I wanted to talk about OSA Broadcast. I'll be showing you a whole new OSA Broadcast today, so it's really exciting. However, before I start, I wanted to talk about microconverters. As you know, we have the three GSDI models, and they support both SD and HD television standards. But we've been working really hard on Ultra HD. So we have three new models today. They're all 12 GSDI, which means we'll have three, three GSDI models, and we'll have three 12 GSDI models in the family. So that's six models in total. Now you can see the 12 GSDI models here, if you can just pan across a little. Um, they've got the exact same features as the three GSDI models. They're still powered by USB, so they're very simple to use. So the first one you can see here is the microconverter HDMI to SDI. Now that's great for convert, uh, connecting consumer cameras to SDI, or converting the computer output to SDI, because computers have HDMI. Um, the next one you can see is the microconverter SDI to HDMI 12G. Now that's the best one for monitoring, of course. Um, it even has a 3D LUT, like the three GSDI model has. So it's great for adding like a LUT for monitoring which means you can use a TV or a computer display for broadcast monitoring. Uh, and then the last one on the side here is the uh, micro converter bidirect SDI to HDMI, sorry, SDI HDMI 12G. Now that's a bidirectional um, uh, uh, model. It converts in both directions at the same time. And just like the 3G SDI model, it can do two different standards in each direction. So like you could have a HD conversion in one direction and an ultra HD conversion in the other directions. Now these 12G SDI models support SD, HD and ultra HD conversions. But there is a new feature on the bi-directional model, on the 12G model, that the 3G model doesn't have. It actually has a 3D lookup table on the SDI to HDMI conversion path. So you can use the SDI to HDMI conversion for monitoring. That's really nice. Now the bi-directional uh, 12G also supports the camera control like the 3D, uh, 3G model does. So you can add it to a HDMI camera and it'll actually convert the control uh, information to the SDI. Um, and then you can connect a HDMI camera to an SDI switcher with all the camera control. So that would mean a big constellation switch you could actually control a HDMI camera. Now it even works the other way, so you can actually have a, like an SDI camera plugged into an A10 Mini, which is a HDMI switcher. And these new models are available today. Now the microconverter HDMI to SDI 12G will be priced from $109. The microconverter SDI to HDMI 12G will be, uh, with a 3D LUT will be priced from $129. And the microconverter Biodirect SDI HDMI 12G will be priced from $149. They cost slightly more if you want to buy them with a power supply included. I think these new microconverter 12G models are going to be very useful and I think they'll be very popular. Okay, so now I'd like to talk about USA Broadcast. Now the old model has done really well, however it's been two years since we ordered sensors and they still haven't arrived. So it's been months since we've been able to build the camera, so it's caused a bit of a problem. So what we did is we worked really hard to update the design to a whole new model. We've been kind of working on it anyway, but now this is what I'd like to show you this new model today. Now this uh, new model will replace the old Ursa uh, Blackmagic Ursa Broadcast. This new model is called Blackmagic Ursa Broadcast G2. It's the next generation of Ursa Broadcast. So it might look similar, but it's a whole new design internally. It's really three cameras in one. It's a broadcast camera, it's a live studio camera, but it's also now a cinema camera. And we've learned so much from the original model, so we've been able to make a lot of improvements and add those into the new model. Now the new Ursa Broadcast G2 is actually here. This is the model. Um, you can see it looks, it looks very similar. Um, you can see the camera body is the same. Uh, it's a bit deceiving because it's so different internally. Um, but it means you can use the same accessories, which I think is going to be really important. So if you want to upgrade the camera body, you can move the accessories over. And that'll save a lot of money. So you get the benefits of the new sensor without all the cost. Plus, it's the same footprint as Ursa Mini Pros, so you can use all the wide range of third-party accessories as well. So I'll, I'll turn the camera around. Um, I'll unplug it. Here, so you can see. So you can see it's got the same con similar controls on the side. These controls can be accessed by feel, which is really great when it's shoulder mounted. So let's have a look at the back here. I'll swing it around and get a close up of that. And then, is that a good shot there? You can see if you can get that there. So you can see on the rear, um, we've got the 12G SDI camera video output. We've also got the 12G SDI input for program return. The 12G SDI input is what includes all the camera control from the switcher so that you can control the camera from the switcher. Now both the SDI connections are used for talk back to and from the camera. You know, we use channels 15 and 16 to do that. There's a reference input there. There's also a headphone socket. Now the uh, headphone socket supports a microphone, so it can be used for talkback. Uh, there's an XLR broadcast power connector, which is standard 12 volt, and it also comes with a power supply. And you'll notice on the bottom there's also a USB-C connection on the rear, and that can be used for a lot of things, but the most important is recording the external you know, USB discs. It lets you record to a USB flash disk, then you can move that disk across to a computer to start editing. So you don't need to copy any files before editing because you just use the disk you've actually recorded onto. So it's so much faster. Now on the top here, um, I might see if I can get that on the top shot there, they've got an overhead view. You can see there's two XLR professional audio inputs under the cover there. These are really low noise and good quality audio is obviously really important on a broadcast camera. And they also include fan and power. So if I swing around to the front, you can see it's the uh, similar lens mounts. Um, uh, I'll show you the side. On the side here, it's got a fold out display. 
Um, you can see it there. Um, now, if I look in the side, if you can get a shot of that, you can see it's basically got the same media. It's got the CFast 2.0 and the SD card support. So you can use the same media as the older model. Plus it also has, has built-in ND filters, so you don't need to carry extra stuff around when you're doing a shoot. That's because the MP ND filters are built into the camera. So that's all the stuff that we've really carried across from the older model. So let's talk about what the improvements are with the new model. Uh, so what's new? So obviously it's got a new sensor. It comes with the B4 uh, uh, mount, lens mount for two third inch B4 broadcast lenses. And so the camera is actually a 4K camera when, you, when it's used with a B4 lens, but the sensor is actually 6K, so it's a 6K sensor. So you can use a larger um, uh, area when you change the lens mount. So say if you wanted to change the lens to an EF or a PL or an F mount, then it's a 6K camera because you've got a larger lens. But if you put a B4 broadcast lens on it, then the aperture is smaller, so it's a 4K camera. So I think it's kind of exciting because you can go beyond 4K. Um, so we're going to include, to really help this, we're going to include an extra EF lens mount in with the camera. Um, and in fact, I'll show you. I've got a, a um, I'll move the little micro converters over here. Um, actually, I'll put them away. And I've got a version of the Ursa Broadcast G2 here with an EF lens mount. Um, so it's got a photography lens on the front. And you can see if I take off the lens, you can see the sensor in the front there. If you can get a, whoops, I'm getting myself a bit tangled up here. So if I bring that around, if you can get a shot of the front there, you can see. And I can show you the ND filters. So you can see those. So it comes standard with a B4 mount, but we have a spare EF um, lens mount in the box. I'll put that back on again. There it is there. So uh, yeah, it has the EF lens mount in the box with the camera. And so it's really good if you're starting out and you wanted to use a photo lens, you could basically change the lens mount and then um, put a photography lens on there. Or you could put a PL mount, and which you can purchase separately and use cinema lenses. Uh, or you can use those broadcast cine servo lenses, which also use PL mount. Um, but for cinema camera work, you can use really top quality cine prime lenses. It's really quite flexible. So you can see it's a broadcast camera, but it's also a digital film camera. Now for television, it's also a HD camera as well as an ultra HD camera. And that's pretty important because most um, broadcasters are running HD. And there's lots of cheap secondhand HD lenses around. Now the camera has amazing low light, which is really important for shooting in ambient light. You, can, can, you, um, you really can't control the sort of lighting conditions when you're doing ENG work. Plus you're often outdoors at night. Um, so it's 25,600 ISO, which means you can add a lot of gain. It's dual native ISO for low light sensitivity, and that's 0 dB and 18 dB, or it's kind of 400 ISO and 3,200 ISO in the different language. There's also 13 stops of dynamic range, so it's much better than the older model. It's an amazing low light camera now. Um, now we've also done some work on the codex. The new model has an amazing range of codecs. It supports Blackmagic RAW for the highest quality, which is really great when you're doing post-production. Um, but it's also got, uh, and it's great for cine cinema quality if you're doing cinema work. But it also includes ProRes for more traditional video workflows. But what we've done now is we've added a H.264 and a H.264 codec, so for much smaller file sizes. And that's what's new. So uh, the other thing we've done is we've actually added the H.264 SDI and the H.265 SDI formats. And these are like professional versions of those codecs. Normally, H.264 and 5 codecs are 8-bit 420, which is fantastic for streaming and archive. But if you know, uh, and it's also pretty good for a lot of cam camera files. You know, it's tight and compact. But um, our SDI versions of the codec are 422 and 10-bit. Uh, plus, they have quite low compression rates. They're very high quality. And the reason we've called it SDI is because it's the same video quality as SDI video, which is also 422 10-bit. Um, so it's the same quality as the video connection that's used through broadcast. Now, these new H.264 and H.265 formats will be great for broadcasters who want to shoot Ultra HD with HD-sized files because I think it's going to be really useful. And it makes it really easy to transition to Ultra HD because it means you can shoot Ultra HD all the time, even if you're only broadcasting HD, because the files are so small, it's no real big deal to use Ultra HD. So I think it's pretty exciting. Plus, all modern computers can handle H.264 and H.265 files now really well. They're very fast to use. Um, they're really snappy. And so yeah, they're really great to edit with, and they don't take a lot of space. It's the perfect file format for broadcast. So what I'll do is I'll show you the codec menu. So if, um, I'll bring this screen up and I'll position myself here. I've got a um, uh, I've got an overhead uh, camera here. Oops, there I am there. Um, so what I can do is I can go into the menu. All right, so you can see it's already on the codec menu. So let's set it to H65, which is over here. And then we want to set it to H65, which lets us use Ultra HD. Generally use H65 for Ultra HD and H64 for HD. Now let's put the SD card in so we can record on it. Um, 
And so let's now go and do a recording. So I'll come out of the menu and I'll start recording by pushing the button there. Now you can see I'm doing a recording. Now you can see it's actually possible now to do an Ultra HD recording on an SD card, which I think is amazing. Now SD cards are the lowest cost media available uh, and it all works in Ultra HD, which is what I'm doing here. Um, so I'll move the camera around a little bit. Um, so you can see we're really, uh, really doing that. That's all in Ultra HD recording now. So I'll take the card out, we'll stop the recording and we'll take the card out and we can move it across the computer and um, you can see this all just works. So I'll put the card over in the computer here. I've got SD card slots in them now. And I can come in here and open up the, uh, so you can cut across to the uh, media. So I can go to the, there's the card there, open that. So you can see the clip. I can drop it in the timeline. And you can see I've got, uh, so you can really see how nice it is to, um, to edit with. It's just so uh, wonderful, you know, trimming and it's just, it's really nice. They just work so beautifully, these files. Um, and if any time you want to do some color correction, you can just come across here and, you know, do some of the color. Of course, I'm not a colorist. <laughs> um, can you imagine using this workflow for documentaries? You know, if you use uh, the camera in Ultra HD, anything you shoot can be used in a film. You know, the line between news and film becomes quite blurred. And that's what's really exciting about the H65 and um, H64 codecs, you know. Um, when you combine H65, Ultra HD and Film Gamma, everything you shoot is film, you know, the camera. Um, so it's wonderful. So the camera also supports USB disks. Now the great thing about USB uh, flash disks, they're very big, so you can store like a whole job on them. So you can just keep shooting for days on the same disk. That's why we put a dedicated um, USB port on the back of the camera. It's a, it's a better place to mount external media disks. I've got a media disk here that I can plug in. So here's a flash disk here. If I plug into here, let's go back and uh, choose Blackmagic RAW for that. So set a nice Blackmagic RAW format. Um, and so it's really exciting. Um, so we, you know, shooting with Blackmagic RAW is obviously cinema quality. So let's do a recording to the disk. There it is there. Now I'm recording directly to this flash disk. Um, so you can see the LCD there in the overhead display. Leave it in a better shot there. Um, so it's really exciting, and it means that you, know, you basically can just keep recording to the disk and then you can move it across to your editing system. And you know, these USB disks are so big, um, and they're very fast too. I'll stop the recording. Um, now there is one new accessory that has changed. Um, the, I'll unplug this disk actually. Um, the uh, Ursa Broadcast GT uses a new SSD recorder. It uses the Ursa Mini recorder, uh, recorder, which is a different version than the previous model of the uh, Ursa Broadcast. Um, it's actually um, USB based, it plugs in the USB connector on the rear of the camera. I can bring it out and show you, there it is there. Um, now it mounts between the battery plate on the camera and the, uh, the camera, so it mounts in between there. So it becomes part of the camera um, and so it moves around with the camera. So you can see it there, uh, whoops, um, there it is there and the SSD goes in the top and it's mounted there. Now it's the same one that's used on the Ursa Mini Pro 12K. It supports SSDs so you can use the same large media disc you've used previously but it also supports U.2 disks, which are very, very fast. So this is a much nicer design. It provides more options for the record media. Um, so there's the USB port on the bottom. Um, so there's so many different types of media that this new camera can use now when you consider all these different options together. I mean, it can use SSDs, it can use U.2 disks, it can use CFast 2.0 um, cards, it can use SD cards, it can use UHS-2 uh, cards, which is a, a sort of a faster version of SD cards, and it can use USB uh, external disks as well. So it's amazing. And then with Blackmagic RAW, ProRes, and H64 and H65, you get like a, the best range of codec formats or file formats available, which is really why it's three cameras in one. You know, you could shoot a commercial in Blackmagic RAW and then shoot a new show, you know, story in H65. You can do it all in Ultra HD, so your media is future proof. And the H65 doesn't take up a lot of space on media servers, so it's pretty nice. Um, I'll move these aside. Now we've got uh, a new version of Blackmagic OS that's running in the camera. It's an updated, uh, it's got some updates. There's lots of small improvements and features. Um, Blackmagic OS makes this camera so nice to use. There's lots of controls, um, on-screen controls that you've got, and you can use the touch screen to access them. I can show you some of them here if you haven't seen this before. Although they're kind of similar to the previous model, but they're, you know, there's a lot of little updates. So you can see the heads-up display there. So you can see the shutter speed um, is there, and it comes up on the bottom. You can also see the gain, um, which is there. So the gain settings are there, you can access them directly. There's also the color temperature over the side here, so that comes up and you've got some presets as well. 
Now, the audio level is actually done from the meters down there, so you can just access the audio meters there, and you can actually hear me talking because it's being picked up on the microphones. Um, now, to access menus, you just use the menu button, which is on the side here, so you can see it there. And so you can see all the different menus, and along the top is the different settings. So you've obviously got the record settings, you've got the monitor settings there, then you've got the audio settings, and you can actually see the meters in there. You've got some setups. There's a lot of setups. You can see along the bottom is a lot of page of setups now. There's a lot of things in here. You can see the presets. You can load camera presets, and the presets can be saved and moved between cameras. And also there's 3D lookup tables because you've got 3D lookup tables, and there's some in the camera. And you can load 3D lookup tables from DaVinci Resolve systems. Now, if I go out of the menus, you can see another nice new feature is we have an RGB histogram. So it shows the clipping in any specific RGB channel. So I've got the uh, adjustment on the side here set to iris. So I can move around, oh, it's a bit dark. Let me put some gain in here and I'll uh, let's put in, oh, that's very bright, that's too much. So now as I adjust the histogram, so I'll darken it down a bit. You can see the, if you get a shot of that there, you can see the different channels. It's probably not the best thing to be viewing, but you can see it's RGB now, so it's really nice. So coming back to the lenses, there's a lot more that actually uh, Ursa Broadcast can do with lenses. Um, that's because it actually works with the Blackmagic focus and zoom demands, which means you can control any broadcast or photography lens. Um, so let me bring, I've got a, a, a camera set up as a studio camera, so I'll bring it across here. So you can see here it is here. Now, you can see this is rigged as a studio camera, so it's the same camera with the studio viewfinder and everything. Um, now, we're just about to start shipping the focus and zoom demands. Uh, we had some part supply issues, like has been happening recently, and uh, so we're just getting them to market really soon. I think the uh, zoom demands are actually shipping just about now. But they work really good with Ursa Broadcast G2. And of course, uh, many broadcast lenses actually have options for like focus and zoom demands. You can buy them for the lens, but that only works with the lens you buy them for. Plus, they cost a lot of money, whereas the Blackmagic focus and zoom demands will work with any lens, so it's much more uh, flexible. Um, they can even control photographic lenses. You know, um, they can control broadcast, older broadcast lenses. Any lens that can be controlled, like you know, has motor controls in it, um, like you know, uh, can be uh, controlled. So it's much, much wider uh, what you can do with these ones because they talk to the camera with USB. So let me show you. So what I'll do is I'll, um, I'll just pan this camera. And we've got a camera over the back here that can swing around and get a shot of the viewfinder. So you can see me over here. So you can see this is a a broadcast lens on a broadcast with the focus and zoom demands plugged into the USB. And so as I'm moving in, you can see I've got really nice control there. It's a beautifully smooth control. It's really very nice. So you can see I can crawl in very slowly, or I can move in much faster. Oops, it's going right out there. And you can see the focus is really nice. Um, so what's really exciting too is that the um, B4 and PL server lenses, actually now there's a new feature we have. They support um, jumping to zoom points. So you can program specific uh, zoom and focus settings and you can recall the preset with a button on the bottom of the focus and zoom demand. So that gets set in the menu. I'll show it on the camera over here actually because I've got the above view. So if I go back into the menus, I can go to setups and I can go, I've got a page back through. There's a lot of setups in here. Oops, I think I just went past it. There they are, whoops, there they are. So what you can see is they're not actually enabled on here because I don't have the you know, controls plugged in. Um, but what I've got is I can plug in, um, I can preset different buttons on the uh, focus and zoom demands as you can see in the menu here. This is part of the new updates in Blackmagic OS. And I can, uh, the buttons uh, two and three are the ones on the bottom of the zoom, of the zoom demand. So I can set those to be uh, the jump, uh, to jump to the specific points. And they're very easy to program. So I'll come back across to the camera and actually show you how it works. Um, so if you just, uh, so all you need to do is if you can get a shot there, I don't know if you can see that shot there. So if I go in, um, I can set the, uh, you just press the button and then hold it to set it to a different zoom point. So I'll go in to that there, focus it. And if I now push this, I'm use, I've programmed the two bottom buttons here for the jump points. So I've got both of them as different ones. So if I hold that in and now it'll preset it. So if I zoom back, it'll go back to that point. See, there it is there. And if I focus this, if I do the second one, so I'll come out a bit, and I'll refocus, because that's got a different focus point. If I do the second one, now I've got this set to do both the zoom and the focus, you can set them individually as well. So now if I go in on the first button, I push the first button, I can basically use the buttons to recall both the zoom and focus that I just created, and if I come out on the second button, you can see it comes out, and it goes in. So you can see how they, they work, it's really nice. And if you go to a different shot, you can still go back to the 
setting your head just by pushing those two buttons there. And the great thing is you, it's really, um, you can change the preset on the button by holding it any time you like. Um, so it's good to use while you're, you know, while you're doing a live production. So if you move back a bit and then you just decide you want to redo that one, you can just hold the button and, and preset it. And now you can see that they're, uh, that's the new spot. So it's very easy to do, you know. It's very easy to set while you're doing it when the camera's on air. Because you can just keep updating it as you, you know, in a live job, you can just keep going. Um, now there's also another new feature, uh, which is really exciting, and it's basically a quick zoom feature with these lenses. Um, parfocal lenses often um, you zoom in to get the focus accurate, and obviously because it's parfocal, it's um, uh, the focus is accurate over the whole zoom range. Um, now what we've done by default, we've actually set this by default on the uh, zoom demand, but the buttons on the side, we've set them to be like a, um, the uh, a quick zoom in. So if I come back around the side here again, it's a little bit clumsy, this, uh, this demo. So if I'm kind of, you know, working and I want to do a quick focus, all I need to do is push this uh, button and it crashes in and I can then focus quickly like that. And I can come back out again, but at least the button it comes back out again. Um, so it's really quite exciting. You can do this, you know, anytime you need to go right in, you can just go in, crash in, do your focus, and it comes back out again, you know, go in. Come back out again, so it's pretty cool. So I don't know if you can see that. Um, so it's really exciting. You can just you know do that anytime you like. It shows how powerful these focus and zoom demands are. They even work with these really big, large box lenses. Now I've got one of those cameras over here, so if you can sort of pan across. Um, now uh, you can see it's it's uh, rigged up with one of these really big box lenses, and I can adjust the focus and zoom demands, which are the black magic focus and zoom demands, and you can see uh, they beautifully control. See how nice it is on going in. I mean, these lenses are crazy. Look at this. Turn up some more of that. Really nice control. So you can see it there. I get a bit more uh, focus peeking in because I'm going to adjust that on the viewfinder. So it's really nice. And I can come out. You can see how smoothly I, I can also do the crash zoom on the side there. These lenses are crazy. So I can come out. So it's just so beautiful. So I can come out wide and I can do another crash zoom when I want to focus. I've got really nice focus control. They're a wonderful lens to use, they're amazing. And you can also um, see I've got a black magic fiber converter on the back of the uh, camera here. It converts empty fiber to um, to uh, uh, up to two kilometers away. It converts the camera to empty fiber. It bolts on where the battery plate is. Now the Simpty Fiber Link is actually a 10G Ethernet cable. Um, so it adds really nice studio camera features to the back of the camera as well. I think you can get a shot of that. Um, so you get extra audio inputs. You've got more talkback controls on the top here. You've also got two uh, talkback headsets you can plug in. Uh, one for regular talkback and one for engineering talkback. So it's really nice. You get a really true professional studio camera features built into the back. Um, and there's information on how all this works on the Ursa Broadcast G2 website. So I'll just come back over. So you can see how much power this camera has. We think it's going to be really exciting. It costs slightly more than the old model though. That's because it's a lot more powerful. Now, I'll just move this out of the way. Now the, uh, the Blackmagic Ursa Broadcast G2 will be priced at 3995. It'll be available today. Um, we think it's such a nice replacement for the original Ursa Broadcast. It retains its ease of use, but it's a whole new camera internally. It's a much better image quality. It's got much better low light capability. It's got a wider dynamic range. It has the new H64 and H65 codecs. It can record Ultra HD onto an SD card. Plus you get all the accessories included. There's a whole bunch of accessories included. Uh, the top handle's included. Uh, the shoulder mount's included. Plus the V-Lock battery plate is actually installed on the back of the camera. So it's all set up, ready to go. Plus you get the spare EF lens mount when you want to use photo lenses. So we do have one more feature to show. Um, this is not available yet. We've been working hard on it. The Ursa uh, Broadcast G2 actually has live streaming built in. Now we'll ship that uh, probably early in the new year, uh, but I wanted to show you now. It'll be a free software update for us at Broadcast G2. So let me explain how this works. Now, the camera could stream to YouTube and Facebook, but it's a little strange because it's really one camera. Where it's really the most powerful is when you're streaming to a switcher. And that really is um, where ATEM Streaming Bridge comes in. Now we have a web presenter product that can stream to a streaming bridge. And what the streaming bridge does, um, and now we can use it with the camera. So what the streaming bridge does is it receives a live video stream and converts it to video. Um, the, you know, the ATEM streaming bridge actually looks a bit like YouTube server, but it's actually just this small converter. So then what you do is you connect the video output of the uh, converter to the switcher. 
And now the camera can actually stream over the internet to your switch's input via this converter. Um, the switcher then, you know, the switcher then live streams to YouTube, you know, because you can switch between cameras and add graphics and actually create your show on the switcher. Um, but you can imagine running a whole bunch of live uh, remote cameras all from your studio. And the cameras can be placed anywhere in the world. You know, it's all built into Ursa Mini, uh, sorry, Ursa Broadcast G2. Now, what's really exciting, uh, and that's very useful, but what's really exciting is that's not all it can do. Um, you've not noticed on the streaming bridge, if you can get a shot of it, it actually has an SDI reference input, which is a little unusual. Normally, you know, it's a standard industry reference input, but this actually has an SDI reference input, and it's for more than just reference. So if you connect this to your ATEM switcher, it'll actually receive the tallying camera control, and the ATEM streaming bridge will basically um, uh, receive a live stream from the camera, but it'll send the tallying camera control back up to the camera almost in the opposite direction of the video stream. So it's not just receiving a video stream and converting the video, it's feeding it back the other way. Now, um, it basically works the same way as connecting the SDI from the switcher to the camera control. You know when you plug a switcher into the camera directly using the program return? It's the same as that, but obviously you can't do that with remote cameras because they're too far away. They're, you know, you're using a, a streaming link to do it. Um, so normally you don't get camera control uh, when you've got remote cameras. And so, you know, I've seen broadcasters uh, that I've watched um, use a phone. They just call the studio on the phone to, you know, because or the studio calls them to tell them to focus and do other things on the camera. But now the camera control can be sent back to the camera live. Now it includes, the control includes things like lens focus and zoom. You can also set gain and other settings from the studio. You can even control the built-in color corrector uh, from the studio. But the most exciting part is actually the tally light. The tally light works so the talent knows when they're on air. So let's check it out, it's really pretty cool. So what I'll do is, um, in fact, I've got the camera running on battery so it's unplugged from the power. So let's sort of simulate a, a remote camera by running it on battery power and we use a phone as the internet connection. So I have a phone here. So here it is here. And what we'll do is we'll use the phone mobile data for, with tethering. So what I'll do is I'll plug the... Uh, oh, and the other thing too I should mention is that you can also use the USB adapter to use it on your local network which plugs into the uh, USB port on the back. And then you can... Uh, there's the adapter there. It's just a standard USB to Ethernet adapter. And then if the camera's on the local network by using this adapter, you can actually see all the streaming bridges and you actually browse them. And the camera will find them automatically because they're in a list because it's used in Bonjour to find them. Now that's great in like, say if you're in convention centers or universities and you've got, um, you might have multiple cameras uh, moving all over the place in different buildings or different uh, theaters, but you've got a centralized control room. You can just plug the cameras in the network and then it'll find the streaming bridges and you'll be able to see them and then the control room can you know, take the cameras. Um, so it's pretty cool. Anyway, let's simulate a uh, remote camera, which is uh, what we use with the mobile phone and, and mobile data. So if I plug this uh, phone into the USB port on the back, now the phone's plugged in, um, and the camera can see the internet via the phone. It also keeps the phone charged. It's actually started charging the phone when it's plugged in. So, and what it'll do is it'll come up as a uh, mobile data. Now, uh, what we need to do is we need to tell the camera where the streaming bridge is, because this streaming bridge is back in a studio and it could be anywhere on the internet. So once we've installed uh, one on the switch, in fact, we've got one on the switcher behind me. This switcher behind me has a streaming bridge uh, connected to it. Um, it's a Constellation switcher with a multi-view visible on the screen. It's got a 1ME, if I move out of the way, it's got a 1ME advanced panel and an ATEM camera control panel. It also has an ATEM streaming bridge connected to input two, which is currently dark. It's, you know, it's black because there's no stream coming in. So all I need to do is tell the camera where this switcher is. Now that's easy because the ATEM streaming bridge can actually create a, a file um, which tells the, uh, can tell the camera where it is. It's the same file that the web presenter uses. You know, the streaming bridge can create the file and give it to the web presenter. The web presenter can load that in and now it knows where to stream to, 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 to talk to the, um, to the streaming bridge. It's the same thing and it basically tells you where the, uh, the streaming bridge is on the internet. So I've saved a file um, here and uh, it's on an SD card. See, so there's the, just a standard SD card. And what we can do is we can put that into the side of the camera and then I can select the file. So I'll show you. So I'll move the stream bridge over here and the uh, adapter. And what I'll do is I'll do that now. Now we need to load the, uh, the file in the streaming settings. So if you can get the overhead here, I can uh, move across to the menu and to get to the streaming settings. Oops, I went past. There it is there. You can see those settings are actually pretty similar to what the um, web presenter has. Now, what we need to do is um, we need to set the, uh, load the settings here. That's set to YouTube currently, so we need to switch across. And there it is there, streaming bridge demo. So that's uh, the settings off the file. Now the camera knows where the streaming bridge is on the internet. It's also worth noting that the IT guys here have opened up the network to the uh, um, streaming bridge here. 
so the streaming bridge is actually on the internet and the camera can see it on the internet. Uh, that's important because uh, obviously remote cameras need to send data to it, so you need to open up your uh, network to allow access to the streaming bridge. So let's start the streaming. So all I need to do is turn the streaming on. There it is there, and it'll start to do streaming. Now the streaming's up and running, it's sending out live video uh, through the phone. The streaming bridge will then receive that um, stream and convert it back to video, and you can see the video appears on the multi UV behind us. There it is there. That's because the streaming bridge is now connected to this switcher, so you can see the um, it's true remote camera. In fact, I've, uh, I think I've got the camera blocking here. I might move that out of the way a little. There it is there. Now you can see the uh, that camera, that's a completely remote camera that is running on the battery with mobile data. I'll just move it back so the overhead view is better. Um, so you can see it's uh, really cool. So let's check out the camera control feature. So I've got the um, the switcher program out connected to this streaming bridge here. Um, but we need to shift the, set the camera number in the camera menu, otherwise the camera doesn't know what to do. So let's do that. So I'll turn off the stream and change the settings um, to the camera number. So if you go back, you can go to this overhead view. Uh, there's a lot of settings in this camera. There's the camera number there. So we'll set it to camera two and we'll go back to our streaming settings. There's the, there it is there. We start our stream up. And now, it, uh, now when the, uh, the switcher is the camera set to camera two now, and now when the switcher tells camera two to do something, it'll follow it. So let's put the camera on air and we'll check it out. So let's have a look here. So if I switch the camera on air, you can see the tally light comes on. There it is there. Uh, it's pretty cool. You see the tally light up as I'm switching on and off. There's a slight latency, but it's really not very much. It's very, very fast as I switch. You can see it there. That's pretty cool. Now the control from the switcher is being sent back up the camera stream back through the phone, back up into the camera. Uh, you can do this anywhere in the world, it's pretty cool. So let's try some camera control. Um, in fact, actually one thing it's also worth noting, if I take the menu off, you can see there's a, if I look at the overhead quickly, I'll just uh, quickly mention this, I forgot to, um, is that you can see the uh, tally ring on the LCD as well, and also when it's on preview, you can see it goes to green. So you've actually got the preview tally on the screen, which is nice. Now you can do this with um, um, a control panel. Um, but, uh, and I'll do, I'll show it with the control panel, but you can do this with the ATEM software control. Uh, the software control comes with every ATEM switcher and it's free. Um, so it's pretty cool. Um, you know, essentially it doesn't cost anything to really do this. Um, but let's do it with the uh, control panel behind me. So as I adjust the iris, the lens will follow. So this is channel two here. So as I adjust it, um, you can see that it, it follows. Um, I can also do autofocus up the top here. I've got an autofocus button. Let's move the iris back up again. There it is there. It's pretty cool, it's all working. Um, and I can even adjust color tint with the knobs. I've got color tint controls here, so I can you know, put a bit of red in. There it is there. This is all happening. You know, this camera is hanging off a phone and I'm doing remote color correction. It's pretty nice, it's really exciting. Um, you know, the control is a bit more latency than the tally. Uh, there's a little bit of latency there, but it works, it's really exciting. Um, of course, it's also worth thinking about mobile data. You know, often when you're in busy, chaotic sort of, you know, live events, the cell phone network can become pretty saturated. So you really, really will need to test solutions for mobile data because you want to really check that out. You need reliable internet for this to work well. Uh, also, there's one other uh, interesting note is if you are recording H6.5 or H6.4 while you're streaming as a remote camera, it'll record the streaming quality. That's because H6.4 and H6.5, uh, the codec, it's the same codec you use for recording and streaming. So if you really want high quality recordings while you're streaming, obviously you can pick a high uh, quality H6, 4 and 5, but you have to stream that. But you could put, um, choose Blackmagic RAW and ProRes, and you can record that in the camera while you're actually live streaming the H6, 4 or 5. So I'm really excited by this feature. I think it makes it so easy for remote cameras to do camera control and tally. Now this software update to make all this work will be available early next year. We're working really hard on it though, um, but when it's released, it'll be a free update for the camera. So that's about it for today's update. I hope you like these new products and they help you out. I can't wait to see how they're used as normal. It's always really exciting to see that. So take care and uh, thanks for watching this update.